Sure. Um, let me. Jason, we'll just need to notify people to start that the, the lecture is being recorded. Right. Is this set up as a as a regular Zoom meeting or is this a webinar? It's it's a meeting. Okay. So all their video will be on it. If uh, yeah. I don't know how it works. Jason well, and Alex, I just wanted to let you know that I have to leave at twelve thirty because I'm teaching. So I'm not offended when I sign off. Okay, it's because I have to go teach. So I just wanted to let you know. Well, we're glad you so, can make it even for you. a bit, Tatiana. So. That seems more than reasonable. <laughs> okay, we have about 17 people, so. And. Let me give people maybe just another moment to, to show up in case one or two other people make their way, make their way in. Did you see the email from Hina Assam? Okay. That, that's why I asked about the recording. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. You're competing against the impeachment, so that's a pretty tough, uh, tough sell. Yeah, that's definitely true. All right, why don't, why don't we get started early so I can, I can at least begin uh, introducing uh, Alex to everybody. Uh, who we're really so excited to uh, to have with us. Um, uh, I'm uh, Jason Lustig. I'm a lecturer and Israel Institute teaching fellow uh, here at UT Austin. Um, and I want to thank all of you uh, for coming. Uh, you know, for what I think uh, promises to be a really fascinating uh, presentation and conversation uh, with Alex K, uh, you know, who's joining us uh, here from Brandeis University. Um, I should say before we get started that we are recording. Uh, this event, um, you know, for some folks who aren't able to make it, um, you know, so we just have to let you guys know that. Um, but you know, thank you for being here uh, in person, uh, well, virtually in person, as it were, right? Um, uh, um, uh, um, Alex K, Alexander K, who's joining us here today from uh, you know from Boston, actually, you know, again, one of the miracles of uh, or of of Zoom, right? And we can be in multiple places at once. Um, you know, um, Dr. K is the Carl, Harry, and Helen Stoll professor or assistant professor of Israel studies at Brandeis University, uh, where he is based in the Department of Near Eastern and Judaic Studies. Um, his research deals um, with the history of Jewish thought uh, with a specific focus on uh, political thought and the history of law, uh, which really is the focus of his book, which he's going to talk about today. Uh, which is entitled The Invention of Jewish Theocracy, uh, The Struggle for Legal Authority in Modern Israel, um, which just came out uh, you know, last year. So something did positive come out of 2020, right? Um, uh, anyway, we are so excited uh, that Dr. K is able to join us. Uh, he's gonna share a short presentation with us, uh, you know, which will lead into a discussion uh, you know, about the key issues uh, in his research. Um, so thank you, Alex, for, for joining us. Jason, thanks so, so much for inviting me. Um, it's honestly a pleasure to speak to you all. I, um, I plan to speak for 15 minutes or so just to give you an overview of the main um, arguments and themes in, in the book. And, um, and then I really look forward to, to the conversation. So let me share my presentation with you here. One sec. Okay, hopefully you can see the, the slides and that looks good. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, uh, the, the book that I just published is called uh, The Invention of Jewish Theocracy, um, which I uh, is a title I chose in the hope of being um, 
somewhat provocative, at least in, in theory, which is to say that theocracy is normally considered as something which is a sort of an old, an older ideology, an older ideology of, of political and legal theory, um, which posits that political and legal authority comes from God, as opposed to newer ideas that political and legal authority flows from the people, um, the demos in some, in some kind of way. Um, but I do claim that um, at least as it, when it comes to certain contemporary religious ideologies in the state of Israel around this theocratic idea, that the way that that, um, the, that ideology of theocracy is articulated is actually not ancient at all, but extremely modern. Um, and so this is like the, the sort of the giveaway of the whole, my, my, my whole theory, which is that um, contemporary theology is actually a recasting of modern European, Christian, post-Christian legal philosophies in a Jewish theocratic key. Um, but, the, but the structure of the ideology is very, very modern indeed. And the reason um, that I chose this um, uh, image for the cover of the book, this is an image which I'll show you in, in more detail here. Um, it's a wood cutting originally by a, a German Jewish artist in the first half of the 20th century called Moses Ephraim Lillian, um, who um, was a member of the Jugendstil, um, uh, sort of German youth art movement and became a Zionist. And this is a wood cutting from his illustration of the, uh, of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And this is Moses coming down with the tablets of law from, from Mount Sinai. Um, but for people that are, are somewhat familiar with um, the history of Zionism, this Moses may look familiar. And the reason the Moses may look familiar is because um, Lillian chose Theodor Herzl's face, the face of the founder of political Zionism, to use for and his woodcutting of Moses, the lawgiver. In fact, this very, very famous photograph portrait of, of Herzl, which hangs on all kinds of walls in Israeli institutions, uh, was also taken by Lillian at, at around the same time. And, and for me, this image really encapsulates um, what um, doesn't need to be, as I'll, as I'll show, but ended up being a, a, an incredible tension in the history of Zionist and later Israeli thought, which is what is the relationship between um, traditional, the traditional Jewish legal tradition and the modern uh, state that um, people like Lillian were trying to, were trying to create. In other words, is the lawgiver um, um, Theodor Herzl with his, you know, his modern suits and his um, nicely um, trimmed beard and his modern liberal ideology, is that the lawgiver or is the lawgiver some, some kind of ancient mosaic tradition? Um, and that tension, uh, I, I think, has been inherent in the Zionist movement for a long time, which um, has often had this kind of identity crisis of uh, deciding whether um, Jewish nationalism should be in some way a continuity of ancient Jewish um, religious ideas or is in fact a revolution against those ideas, bringing Jews and Judaism into a modern, um, into, into the modern times, um, kind of abandoning all of that religious baggage for a modern political ideology. Now, the, what I'm particularly interested in is the way that this tension plays out in the legal theory of the modern state of Israel. And in particular, I look at the ideologies of, uh, of what the literature calls religious Zionism. So. Just, the, the, just to define that term briefly, religious Zionism is um, um, the Zionist is, is the ideology of Orthodox Jews who are also Zionists. And of course, there are many Orthodox Jews historically who have not been Zionists, and many Zionists who have not been Orthodox Jews. Um, and, but there is a, in the Venn diagram there is this overlap between Orthodox Jews who are Zionists, so people who have a commitment to the, the halachic tradition, and also to modern. Jewish nationalism. And for them, this tension um, is the most acute and um, because they have this commitment to these to both of these strands of thought. And the question is, how were they going to negotiate the relationship between these two things? Now, um, one of the ways of negotiating between the, the, this tension or, um, between ancient and modern theocratic, democratic, however you want to phrase it, um, is to say um, that the tension is absolute that basically you have a choice. Either you have a modern secular democracy or you have some kind of religious 
theocracy. Either legal authority comes from God or it comes from the secular legislature, and there's no middle ground between those two um, the, between those two ideas. And in fact, the, um, the 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 idea that this is a zero sum game um, is not just possible, but it's actually um, the belief, the the organizing belief around this tension that I've tried to articulate that characterizes the opinions of both the religious Zionists that I look at and also the secular um, democratic wing of, of Israeli society that opposes that ide ideology. In other words, both people that support the idea of um, the, in, the importation of Jewish religious traditions into Israeli law and the people that oppose it both sides of this um, debate tend to um, embrace the belief that there is a zero sum game here and you either win it or you lose it. So here, for example, is Betzalel Smotrich, a, a, um, a very right wing um, religious ideologue whose star is actually rising, if anything, in the Israeli um, political firmament at the moment. And just a couple of years ago, um, in an election in which he was running, um, hoping to be Minister of Justice, which he, he didn't get the position in the end. But this is the reason that he said he wants to be the Minister of Justice, which is, and he wants the justice portfolio because he wants to restore the Torah justice system. Um, and he says he thinks the Torah's monetary laws are much better than the laws of the state of Israel, and he wants to grant the rabbinical court to higher status and essentially impose um, the, the law of halakha to be the law of the state of Israel. Um, and I could show you um, hundreds of examples of other people on the religious right in Israel who feel the same thing, that there needs to be an increase of basically a religious takeover of the legal system of, of Israel. Meanwhile, on the democratic left that pushes against this idea, and there is also a So it looks like uh, we lost Alex, uh, at least momentarily. Uh, so um, hopefully he will be back in just a moment, you know. Yes, I've uh, managed to text him there. He's asking to come in and let me make sure there he is. Um, hello, hello, hello. Hi there. Hi, um, I, I'm terribly sorry. My computer had problems, so I've called back on my phone. Um, okay. and I hope that you can now hear me, and um, I, I apologize for the technical glitch. Um, I think this means that I won't be able to share slides with you, but I'll, if it's okay, I'll just take the last five minutes to talk through where I was going with this, and then, and then we can move on with the conversation. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, super, thank you. Um, and apologizing for a slight wobbliness as I'm holding my phone in, in front of my face. Um, this wasn't my intended setup, but uh, we, we, we persevere. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know where I cut out, but the, the, basically the argument I was making is that both, um, both proponents and opponents of theocracy argue that basically this is your choice between a rule of law on the one hand or a rule of halakha on, on the other hand. Um, now, what I argue in, in, my, in my own work is that this is not, um, this, this idea that there is a necessary opposition um, between these two ideologies is not um, historically um, true to, to the evidence that we have. And let me say um, a little word then about A, what alternative um, organization that could have been and B, why that alternative was not taken. So um, the alternative possibility to this kind of exclusivist theocracy, the idea that basically all law in the state of Israel has to be 
um, a halachic law, a religious Jewish law. Um, what is the alternative to that? The alternative to that is a kind of um, uh, legal pluralism. So legal pluralism is an idea that within a single polity or a single group or territory, there can be more than one law that is simultaneously operational. Um, and th there's a large literature in, among legal philosophers on legal pluralism. But suffice it to say that for most of history, most places in the world had some version of legal pluralism. So let's say in England, where I grew up, um, there were, until the 19th century, there were um, maybe tens of courts that could pertain to any single individual and like many, many different legal systems that, that, that could apply to a single individual. There was the chancery courts, there was common law, there was maritime law, there was canon law, universities had their own law and their own law courts, um, and so on and so on. It wasn't until the 19th century um, that legal reforms in Britain, but also in France and Germany and other European countries, um, kind of streamlined law to make the state the one and only exclusive holder of legal authority, which imposed its legal hierarchy on all other sources, um, on, on, on all other law and legal institutions in the state. Um, and when it comes to Jewish communities, just like with Christian communities and Muslim communities and other religious groups in, um, all over the world, before the modern period, legal pluralism was how people organized themselves. So for pre-modern Jewish communities, Jews by and large considered themselves to be subordinate to, to be bound by halachic law, which they understood as deriving from the revelation on Sinai, absolutely. But they also consider themselves bound by other sources of law. For example, um, the law of the state, the non-Jewish state in which all, all Jews lived as, as, as minorities. They, they considered within their own legal ideology the non-Jewish law of the non-Jewish state to be binding on them. Similarly, even within Jewish communities, alongside rabbinic courts, there were very often courts that were run by lay leaders that wrote their own legislation. In other words, this is Jewish law, but it's not halachic law. It's law produced by the Jewish community that works alongside halachic law. And in the state of um, Israel, and actually in, in a couple of decades before Israel was founded in 1948, a number of religious thinkers proposed this pluralistic vision for how they themselves thought that the law of Israel could run. They thought that perhaps rather than have halakha as the exclusive law of the state, which was entirely unprecedented in all of halakhic history, um, because the state itself is a relatively new phenomenon, and the idea of applying halakha to an entire state, including to people that are Jewish and are not Jewish, um, and, and forcing halakha into a system which um, required a, a democratic egalitarian ethos and which itself was also foreign to halakhic history rather than that embrace the kind of legal pluralism that jews had um, um submitted to and and thought and thought was the way of organizing themselves for basically the entirety of their history and the the idea would be that there would be some kind of parallel legal system in israel maybe one a rabbinical legal system and a democratic secular legal system and the people would somehow have the ability to choose which one to go to and they would all be under the auspices of the state in one way or another. Now, there's a lot more to talk about to sort of pad out how that system would actually look like in practice, but I want to just finish with my last two minutes by saying that that's not what happened. That the um, um, the, this idea was rejected both by the secular establishment simply because they didn't want to have rabbinical courts having any place in the country. And just to be clear, the founders of the state of Israel were overwhelmingly secular and sometimes even militantly anti-religious um, Jews who did not want rabbinical law to have this kind of role in the state. Um, but it was also rejected by Orthodox leaders. And the question is, why would Orthodox Jews reject something that was so central to the way that Jews had run their lives for so many centuries? And the argument I make is that it's incredibly ironic that the people that opposed the idea of pluralism and say, we, we won't allow um, um, rabbinical courts to exist in a pluralistic landscape. They have to have exclusive control over all of the law in the state. The people that did that, did that because they had um, absorbed in their own education, consciously or unconsciously, the ideas of the modern European secular state, which argued that a state can only have one single all-encompassing exclusive hierarchy of law. In other words, it was the very fact that they had absorbed 
this modern legal philosophy, which led them to reject the possibility of sharing the polity with non with any law that wasn't exclusively religious. Now, this idea of halachic exclusivity was completely rejected in practice. It didn't it didn't take hold in the state of Israel in the in the 1940s or the 50s, and it was largely forgotten for the first few decades of the state. Um, um, so why is it important? Why is it interesting? I think it's interesting because the ideology of an exclusive halachic theocracy, although it didn't take hold um, in practice, it did take hold in the ideology of many rabbinic leaders in Israel. And um, although it was it kind of simmered under the surface for a while, now that in Israel, not unlike in the United States and in other countries as well, now that a there's a kind of resurgence of um, of political engagement and um, power among um, conservative religious um, figures and movements, this ideology is becoming more and more prominent. And, and what I hope is that my work um, not um, is helpful historically for kind of showing the background and the theoretical um, alternatives that were available um, compared to what uh, the ideas that are embraced today. Um, but also it shows that from within the Jewish tradition itself, this idea of exclusive theocracy is far from a natural position, but is it in fact a, a rather modern, um, paradoxically modern uh, ideology. So um, that was a very brief overview of all my ideas and, I, and uh, I'll leave it there and, and um, look forward to the conversation. And uh, while I'm doing that, I'm gonna try and put my phone down in a way that doesn't immediately fall over. Okay, one second. Yeah. Okay, um, that, yeah, so, um, um, so Alex, I just want to thank you. This is really a fascinating, uh, a fascinating uh, sort of insight into into this issue, which is a lot, a lot going on there. Um, I um, want to take the prerogative to ask kind of um, a, a general question, you know, which can then lead into a broader conversation. Right? Obviously, I think there are a lot of questions. You know, I see that Dina and Michael already raised your hands, um, but I think you know what you're talking about here is, is part of a. Uh, a, a very large conversation about the the function of the Zionist movement in terms of trying to to lay claim to to the past in some way, right? Uh, but that in reality, much of it is very modern, as opposed to being a throwback to ancient times, you know, or whatever. And I was wondering if you could maybe comment on that a bit more, in particular, in terms of this question, like which you which you you ended on uh, about the ways in which legal pluralism. Right, you know this tension between legal pluralism and uh, um, and like you said, this kind of like claim of hegemony uh, is actually a, like a very modern thing, right? Because like if you go throughout Jewish history, you know, legal pluralism is in certain ways the norm, right? Whether we're going from the like the fundamental existence of two Talmuds, right, that are in, in some respects in conversation with each other, you know, to the the fact that Jewish autonomy. Uh, in early modern Europe, for instance, was based, you know, Jewish security was based on legal pluralism, right? So mm -hmm. like, do you maybe want to like comment about this issue of the ways in which, you know, these people who are claiming for exclusive hegemony of, uh, you know, of religious law, you know, are sort of in conversation with um, sort of the broader phenomenon of what's going on here? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it, of course, you're right that the, um, I mean, it, it's it's talked about a great deal within the, the, the scholarly literature on Zionism in general, the relationship between Zionism and its Jewish past. Um, in a way, Zionism had this kind of um, um, like Janus faith um, that its, its founders needed to um, appeal to a continuity to the past because they, they understood their, their very legitimacy to be based on the fact that there was this kind of and primordial Jewish nation that they were just representing in the, in the modern period. But at the same time, they felt the need to reject the past because um, their whole goal was um, Jewish nationalism as a kind of revivalist movement of some ancient idea that they that they felt had been um, kind of um, abandoned or had gone into abeyance um, when the Jews had been in the exile or, or, or the diaspora. What's, what's particularly interesting to me is that that tension between the present and the past um, is just as, as, as evident among people who understood themselves to be unabashedly um, orthodox conservative thinkers. In other words, the people that I'm looking at 
and it consciously at least didn't feel that they had this tension between the modernity and the past they absolutely saw themselves as in 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 continuity and had no interest in revolting against the the past whatsoever even as their secular counterparts very self-consciously talked about a revolution against the past the people that i studied didn't and yet their thought um clearly has this this tension within it so um just to pick up on some of the examples that you talked about um jewish law for example um is um is pluralistic in more ways than one it's pluralistic in the sense of the different kinds of um, authorities, legal systems that Jews found themselves um, subject to. But even within halakha itself, there is no single halakhic authority. There's no pope um, that determines, you know, what the law ultimately is going to be. Different Jewish communities forever, for, for, for millennia, have had their own um, local authorities that decide the law, and the, the law may be slightly different in one place over another place. And Jewish law has, has, uh, um, has certainly never been territorial. In other words, halakha is, has always been meant to apply to, to Jews rather than to people living in a certain territory. Now, when the people that I look at think about imposing Jewish law on a state, they need to radically reinterpret their tradition because what they're talking about now is using a, um, a territorial border to determine who their law applies to and doesn't, as opposed to religious identity. And they're also talking about centralizing what the law should be and removing authority from kind of local rabbinic authorities. And, and people who are, those of you, I mean, all of us who are, who are kind of scholars of political thought and of modernity will recognize that this is a tendency towards centralization, modernization, bureaucratization, and the imposition, the, the, um, the, granting of total authority to the state as opposed to smaller um, political bodies. And this is a, like a very modern phenomenon, um, which required a, a real reinterpretation and recasting of traditional um, religious texts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I saw we had some further questions from you know people who, who are joining us, which I think is fantastic. Um, I see Sammy, you have your hand up. Do you want to maybe you know, get us started. Okay, um, thank you so much for your talk. That was really uh, fascinating. I'm no expert at all in Jewish law, but I have kind of a few things to share with you. So I think you might have answered that just in the last comment that you just shared with us. So my, so my understanding of Jewish law that it was developed outside of state sanction. And so what you described in the book seems almost a kind of, kind of a reversal of that process. And uh, so for me, so I guess my question is that the imagination and the projects of these movements who went to uh, have uh, Jewish law to be the state law, basically it seems to be animated by the nature of the political project that being successful for having a Jewish national state. So I wonder uh, if there's any critique to the, to the type of the profound changes that will happen to that, to that tradition if these things go in that direction and why the focus on law specifically rather than other areas of the state that it can be controlled. Thank you. Yeah, that's a tremendous question. Thank you so much. Um, I, um, so there's a lot to say there. First of all, um, I mean, what you're saying is, is entirely accurate. Um, there's, a, there's a deep irony here, which is that, um, um, among, which is that the people that I'm writing about are, um, they see themselves as, a, as essentially rescuing the religious tradition. They see themselves as under assault by modernity and um, by the modern state, by the secular rulers of the modern state that they feel are marginalizing them. They're also writing in the aftermath of the Holocaust and they see that the centers of Jewish learning have been absolutely destroyed and they're kind of hanging on for dear life. And they think that the whole thing may disappear. And they see themselves as holding up um, the, the continuity of tradition. And I want to be clear that, you know, I, I'm talking a lot about the changes that they make and the paradoxes here and the ironies here. But of course, there is in their own lives and writing a tremendous amount of continuity in terms of their fealty to religious texts and their, um, their spiritual kind of mindset and, and, and so on. And that, that's all there. Um, but, the, the, but when it comes to it, in order to preserve that religious tradition in the context of a modern nation state, inevitably they have to make substantial changes. And the, the, the irony, I keep using the word irony because I'm so struck by it whenever I think about it. The irony is that it's the people that want 
most of all to have Jewish law, to have exclusive control in Israel, those are the people that are making the most radical changes and reinterpretations to the tradition. They don't admit that they are, but of course they are, because the state in itself is a new phenomenon. Almost all of halakha was developed well before anybody even thought of the state in its modern, in its modern form. Um, and especially um, a state which was going to be you know, um, um, democratic, egalitarian, to have um, a, a, a formal dedication to equality between men and women, between people of different religions and whatever else. And so, and, and these are all things which are new in halakhic history. So it's their very devotion to continuity that required them to make these changes. Um, had they said, look, we see the state is here, we support it in whatever way we do, but we're not gonna kind of imbue it with a, any kind of religious significance. And we're gonna stay in our own community and live our lives separately from the state apparatus it would have actually enabled them to have um, less radical reinterpretations. And many communities did take that option. It, the people I write about are not the only ones. Um, but I hope that that gives you some sense. And just one very brief word about the why law question. Um, that is very profound. I, 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 just to say clearly, it's not only in law that these kinds of battles take place. Of course, these people are active in, in, in political discussions and community discussions and budgeting discussions and so on. Um, um, I'm interested in law because it's a way of, of really showing very, very starkly the application of modern jurisprudential ideas to, to, to uh, religious communities. Um, and I'm particularly interested in it um, because, and I'll just say one more brief word here because I, I think it may open up avenues of conversation which are helpful as well. Um, one of the kinds of dynamics that is going on here is a post-colonial dynamic actually which is, and, and I'll just very briefly say what I mean by that. Um, the, um, there are all, the, the, the relationship between Zionism and colonialism is, is, is uh, a large topic, which we can get into with, with pleasure. But, as, but from the perspective of Jews in the British mandate, they felt themselves, they believed themselves to be a colonized people, um, colonized by the British. I understand that this is also complicated because for Palestinians who were living in the British mandate, they found themselves colonized not just by the British, but also by European Jews who had come in to establish the Zionist movement. But from the perspective of the Jews themselves, they were part of this kind of, um, colon in, had this kind of co colonial identity, this colonized um, subaltern identity. And as we know, um, with the, the dynamics of, of colonial and post-colonial education, and it's often the people, um, um, among subaltern peoples who are most active in promoting the um, independence, nationalist independence, these are often the people that are most educated in the philosophies and the ideologies of the imperial powers themselves. And the people that I write about, that's true too. They are rabbis, absolutely steeped in the Jewish and the Talmudic tradition, but they also have degrees in all kinds of things from German, British, and other kinds of universities. And I think it's it's that that's the origin of this sense of, you know, well, if a law is a law, then it has to be a state law, it has to be exclusive, it has to be hierarchical, and so on. I was gonna say, Michael, you've had your hand raised for a while. Um, I don't know if you want to jump. I in. wonder if you discuss Nachum Rakover in your book, in your book, because what he did was fascinating in that his approach as Deputy Attorney General was to get the Knesset to look to the Talmud and, for example, in real estate law and things of that nature, and adopt. Talmudic uh, default provisions as part of Israeli domestic law. So he did the uh, halacha as part of the, you know, law of the state in the pluralistic society. Sure, absolutely. Um, thanks for bringing him up. Fascinating character. Rakova was um, one of the... Um, um, I don't know about the leaders, but he was one of the representatives, I would say, of a school that was called the Mishpat Ivri School, um, which is um, the, the school of Hebrew law. And there's actually an interesting relationship between people like him and the people that I write about. Um, there's a similarity and there's a difference. So there is this school that started in, in Russia, actually, in, in the 19-teens, 
um, which was a, a group of Zionists, Jewish nationalists who said um, that when it comes to a Jewish state, that state law should be based on Jewish law. But they didn't come at it from a, an orthodox religious perspective. They came at it from the perspective that um, nationalists may have to a national uh, literature or musical tradition or theatrical tradition, something like that. In other words, this is our own national culture, they said, um, which we should mobilize to be the law of the modern state. But of course, it can be changed, it can be altered, it can be modernized, we can pick and choose, we'll take some things that we like, we'll leave some things that we don't like, but we should recognize it as a kind of national um, asset that we, we should draw on. And Rakova was, was um, sort of somebody in that school. Um, the, the people that I write about, interestingly, even though the Mishpat Ivri, the Hebrew law school people, are in many ways um, aligned in their interests, that they, ha they, they want Jewish law to be a, a source of law for the state. Some of the people that I write about who are um, more ideologically orthodox than some of the Hebrew law school people um, um, opposed that idea because that idea was saying they're drawing on Jewish law as a national asset, whereas the people I write about saying we're drawing on Jewish law because God gave it to us on Sinai. It's not like a piece of literature that you can use to kind of bolster your modern identity. Um, so there was a kind of alliance, but it was an uneasy alliance, which has actually changed over time as well. Um, but thanks, thank you, Michael, for bringing up Rakov. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, to, in, entrenched power never likes to give up power wherever they are. Is what you're saying is is very interesting. But is is it a topic of conversation in Israel today amongst uh, people in power? Or, you know, gee, gee, we have a system. We we came into the system through serendipitous ways. Uh, what can we do to improve it? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, it is a conversation. Um, I, I, I think, you know, in some ways, the ideologies that I've just briefly given you an overview of have become not just ideas, but also identity markers nowadays. Um, so in the way that, um, I don't know, in the United States, I don't know, like gun rights, you know, people may have ideas about um, whether you have a right to bear arms and what that might mean, and we could have interesting conversations about it, but but often it becomes a kind of identity marker in, in a sort of reflexive and um, political tribalism kind of way. And I'd say that that's something similar is true in, in Israel regarding this position, um, which is that um, you'll have some people who, who, who are arguing for, you know, the exclusive application of Jewish law, even people who have not given us moments thought about what that actually might mean in practice. Um, and similarly, you have people who, so, um, um, you know, there was a, a book that came out a couple of years ago interviewing um, leading rabbis in the state and asking them what they thought about democratic law. And, and um, you know, even in th theory, they didn't say in practice, would you fight for this? But theoretically, do you think the state should be taken over by Torah law? And, and the overwhelming majority said yes, that they do think that. So, but even though that's the position of the majority of the spiritual leadership of the, of the religious Zionist movement in Israel today, the rank and file and the rabbis themselves, of course, make extensive use of the secular legal system, um, including the rabbinical courts themselves sometimes go to the secular courts to settle debates. That's, that's happened too. So the ideology is an idea, but, um, but when, it comes to, when it comes to practice, it can fall out in different ways. The reason I'm saying this is because if you look in the political rhetoric around the what appears to be infinite election loop in Israel these days, this idea of Torah law or Talmudic law or the authority of the rabbis is often brought up on both the right and the left as, a, as, an, as an arguing point. Um, and um, um, and I, 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 even by people that have not necessarily thought through exactly what their positions may mean in practice, but, but because you know it's a, it's a way of gathering votes in this kind of tribalistic environment. Um. I don't know if anybody else has any questions right now. I, I have something I want to ask that builds off of what Steve was asking, which is how mm -hmm. does this, especially when we consider the more recent ongoing conversation that you're talking about, about the uh, the place of, of halakha, of Jewish law, in the uh, the contemporary Israeli state, how does this fit into the sort of parallel 
conversation about uh, Israel as a Jewish or as a democratic state. Uh, you know, um, obviously there's a whole debate that's going on uh, in terms, you know, both over the course of the entirety of the history of Zionism, and what is what is the what is the future Jewish state, you know, or what is the Jewish state going to look like? Um, but it also is there's you know very specific legal debates that are taking place about you know is Israel a state of the Jewish people's particular you know or a state of all of its citizens um, you know where does this conversation about the nature of law fit into these other kind of ongoing legal and social debates that are that 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 are, that are continuing as well? Great. Um, so. I'm just pausing because there's a, there's, a, there's a lot to say about this, but um, um, of course, Israel being in its own self-definition, a both Jewish and democratic state raises all kinds of, of questions and has done since inception. And I want to emphasize that, of course, these questions take place on a practical realm as well as on a theoretical realm. In other words, you can have a political ideology that you could theoretically say is legitimate, but in practice, it may play out um, indifferently or not, not be held to the standards that it holds itself to. Um, what, what I find fascinating is that you, you may think that um, religious thinkers will automatically be on the, if there is a tension between a Jewish state and a democratic state, which some people disagree that there is, but if there is a tension, you may think that religious thinkers would automatically be on the Jewish side of that, of that scale, that, you know, let's sacrifice democracy for the, for the Jewish ideas. What I found to be absolutely fascinating is that the people that I, that I am looking at who are, as I said, people who are devoted to um, preventing a modernization of Jewish law to, to, to um, preserving the continuity of the Jewish, the, the, the Halachic tradition. These people were the most creative I have seen um, in trying to make Halacha as egalitarian as possible. And they came up with some remarkably creative ways to do this. So, to, just to be clear, historically speaking, halacha it, um, dis discriminates between Jews and non-Jews, between men and women. Um, and I'm talking about, of course, in the pre-modern period. In the, in the modern period, there are all kinds of Jewish groups who have, who have made halacha more egalitarian in, in one way or another. But these are orthodox rabbis who are trying to figure out what would it mean if we say that the state has to be run by halacha, we also therefore have to make halacha more democratic, more egalitarian, and they figured out all kinds of ways to do this. Um, and I'll, I'll just, I, I, there, are, there are all kinds of kind of um, mechanisms that they used to do this. And I'll just say one of them because I think it um, is actually very helpful for a way of thinking about politics today. Some of them recognize that one of the problems um, that, that comes up with tensions over political ideology happens when people um, um, invest a tremendous and religious significance in political structures. In other words, if you're somebody that thinks that the state is some kind of manifestation of divine will, you're going to want that state to be a certain way, and you're going to be a lot more inflexible about, um, about different kinds of concessions that you may take. But some of the people that I wrote about said, okay, so if we say that the state is a manifestation of divine will, that kind of boxes us in in what kind of changes and modernizations we're able to make. Well, what happens if we think about the state completely differently? Let's think about the state not as some kind of messianic polity. Let's think of it as a, a kind of business arrangement. In, business, in, in Jewish law, business arrangements have tremendous leeway in terms of the terms of contracts that you can make with, with each other. So why not think of the state in the same way? Let's not say it's some kind of divine vehicle. Let's say, look, we're making an arrangement with people that live here and we have to figure out how best to live together. So if that means that men and women and Jews and non-Jews all have to have equal rights before the law, all have to be able to run for office and, and vote and become judges or whatever it is, then we're willing to do that. And actually I'm kind of inspired by the fact that these like archetypally religious figures are the people that came up with the thought of actually demystifying the state and actually re reducing the metaphysical investment in the state for the purpose of um, making the state more egalitarian and more um, open to um, all of its citizens. And there are, of course, many caveats to that. And in terms of the practical politics of these people, they didn't always go in that kind of more pluralistic, more democratic direction. But this kernel in their thought, actually, I find very interesting 
as a possibility for a kind of constructive modern political ideology. Go, go ahead, Sammy. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much again. I'm, I'm sorry to bother you with some questions. I am uh, so happy that you're here and talking about this. It's the best. So I guess my question is the following, uh, based on the last thing that you said. Um, I was wondering if you have recommendations or have ideas about works um, out there where that might discuss legal or political, kind of, kind of some sort of um, uh, patrology that, um, that transcends the current status of state law to something else beyond the moment which they live. So uh, is that critique of the nation state exists in which that people are aware of the, it's moral and, and kind of, but the type of structure that people live in today, for example, the work by Wael Halat at Colombia, uh, The Impossible State, uh, it goes in that direction by calling people that there's something that needs to be thought about. They'll have to really go beyond the moment in which they live and project themselves into the future beyond the moment that they live, politically or legally. But, that can, but I'm not familiar how that works in the Jewish tradition. Thank you. Oh, that, I'm so happy you asked that. And, and the answer is yes, absolutely, emphatically yes. And um, there's, this, there's been this strand in Jewish thought really since the rise of the nation state, which is um, a, a, in some ways a, a and there, there are of course different versions of this, but the most extreme version is essentially a rejection of the possibility of full human political authority. And um, in other words, um, if God is king, and, and again, I'm using this masculine language that, that, that the people that I'm thinking about were using in the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century. And if God is king, that means that human beings don't have, don't ever have the ultimate political authority. Um, and that the state is um, necessarily suspect. Um, so um, in terms of practical political philosophies, this went in a certain, in different directions. Um, there was, a, one is a kind of religious um, socialism. One is a kind of religious anarchism. And I'm thinking of people here like uh, Martin, Bub Martin Buber, who was like one of the great um, proponents of this, this perspective. More recently, Yeshayahu Leibowitz, um, um, an, an Israeli, um, he was a scientist actually, but, but um, wrote a great deal about theology and Jewish law as well, um, wrote that essentially the role of theology is to um, oppose or at least question the nature of human political authority per se and certainly to question the idea that the state is the ultimate um, political authority, which, which made him very, very suspicious. For me, I find these ideologies, um, I would say um, they are good grounds for, for inspiration and for fertile thinking, but when it comes to practical application, they need a little bit more um, fleshing out, which is to say, as, a, as an idea, like if you want to say, we need to be skeptical of the nation state, we need to be skeptical of its claim to hegemony, we need to be skeptical of the idea of the monopoly on legitimate um, violence, or, or I should say, the, on, on the use of that, on the extensive use of that monopoly on, on, on legitimate violence, and religion and religious law is a source um, by which we can um, critique and um, oppose um, um, resist that kind of that kind of hegemony. That seems to me like completely reasonable as a as a as I would say an ideological orientation. But if you want to build a state where people actually live together and like figure out laws and stuff like that, then you need to figure out what does that look like in in practice, especially given you know the fact like and, and some people will say it's an unfortunate fact. Some people will say it's an it's an inevitable fact. But it is nonetheless a fact that the world today is basically organized around the state system and just saying well i disagree you know is is helpful maybe as, an, as a philosophical orientation but as a political practice i think it needs a little bit more fleshing out to have real teeth as a political program um so uh yeah i, I mean this is a this is a question in political philosophy which i know you're interested in and i, I actually one of the dreams i have is 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 um, convening um, some kind of conference that, that that looks at these kind of religious attitudes towards law, constitutionalism, and approaches to the nation state, because I think there's a tremendous overlap between Jewish, Islamic, Christian, and other religious traditions on exactly this question. Yeah, uh, I see that Efrain also raised his hand. Um, you know, so yeah. So uh, hearing all this, uh, I mean, I am overwhelmed by all the discussion.
And I was wondering, as a, just a person in, uh, who hasn't much introduction to all this, what are some tips or some advice to give to someone who doesn't know much about Jewish uh, history or, you know, all of this, but is interested in being educated and staying informed with all these aspects? Uh, what would you uh, have to say for that? Thank you very much for the question. Um, I Is it undignified to recommend my own book? Um, I think, I, I, think I, I, I hope you'll find um, if you take a look at the book that um, that certainly the introduction gives a gives a kind of a good overview of the history of these kinds of questions and 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 and, and just the practical history of it before delving into um, more modern stuff. Um, other than that, um, there's a, there's a few different examples of of, of works I can give. Um, so, I mean, let me just off the top of my head suggest a couple of works for you that, that may be interested uh, may be interesting in terms of Jewish political philosophy per se. Um, so first of all, I, if ever I'm asked to recommend anything in Jewish history, I always recommend Zachor, um, which is spelled Z-A-K-H-O-R, um, and it's by Professor Yerushalmi, um, who was my teacher at Columbia, which um, is probably, the, the, in my opinion, the best small encapsulation of the relationship between Jews and modernity, between history and memory. Um, um, I, I would also, if you're interested in, in just the array of Jewish attitudes to modern political thought, there's an excellent small book by Adam Mendelssohn called, what's it called, Jason? Jewish political, Jewish politics, something like that. Um, Ezra Mendelssohn. Look it up. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the, the, the author is Ezra Mendelssohn, and you'll, you'll find it. I, I'm, 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 I'm suggesting these two books because they are brilliant and also short and give like good overviews. Um, and it, when it comes to Israel in particular, I mean, when it comes to religious legal philosophy in Israel in the English language, there isn't a great deal. Um, my book is, is one of the things that are out there, but um, if, if there's more specific questions you have on like, um, on particular areas of, of this topic, um, please feel free to email me at Brandeis and I'd be happy to send you endless recommendations. Yeah, because I don't know. I feel like the hardest thing for someone to get into these aspects is is like prior knowledge, and some people like that. But I, I'm always interested in just knowing more about these topics. It fascinates me. With pleasure, and and it will depend on if we're talking about Israeli law, or if we're talking about Jewish law, or talking about Jewish thought, politics, whatever else. Like I, I give you different um, recommendations depending on the particular area you were interested in. Um, uh, when it comes to Israeli law, check out the work of Nir Kedar, K-E-D-A-R, um, who recently wrote a book on like legal culture in Israel, which I, which I think is, is quite a nice overview of that topic. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously like, you know, endless things to, to read, you know, um, and I, I think this is actually a great question. Also, I think a lot of times when we have these kinds of conversations, they're, they're at a high level, which is really fantastic. Um, you know, there's always the question of where do you get started, you know, right. with kind of an interest in all of these things. And for me, and, and you know, one of the, one of the questions that I, I have for, for you, Alex, is when you think about your book, when you think about your research on the sort of the place of law in Israeli society, like on the one hand, you're making a contribution to like a very specific scholarly literature, right? You know, some of which you, you mentioned, but you're also, um, you know, talking about something that's like a really big picture issue that is, I think, really significant and important, not just in terms of the context of Israel and Palestine, but right. really much broadly, where we look at all sorts of societies and the question is like, how does law function? You know, who gets who gets to make law, you know, uh, you know, uh, who follows it, who doesn't follow it, um, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And I was wondering if you can maybe just comment on this as well, right? Uh, which is that, that when you think about your work and, and kind of this whole general issue, of the nature of, of law and how it functions in society. Like, how do you think that, that looking at the case of the modern state of Israel and, and the debates about uh, religious law helps us to understand the, 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 the idea of law in a much broader scale, you know, whether that's in a comparative way with other societies or, or you know, sort of more um, you know, philosophically, et cetera? Yeah, great. Thanks, Thanks very much for that question. Yeah, so I think um, I think my work can help with that in in a few ways. 
first of all, um, I think there is a very common rhetoric right now around the relationship between religious and secular society um, or theocracy and liberalism, which assumes the kind of zero sum game that I talked about in the Israeli context. And I think that's true in, in the United States as well. Um, that, there's, that there's something called religion and there's something called secularism or something called um, you know, theocracy or conservatism and there's something called um, liberalism and democracy. And these two things are just like different stories. And what used to be is the people were religious and now they're secular and those two things are, are opposed. And we, if you want one or the other, you need to fight um, for what's right. And my work, I hope shows that if you, the historical record um, shows that, that, um, that the necessity of that and kind of that clash that sometimes literally physically violent clash is just, um, is just not, um, it's not been around for very long. And the reason that it's around now is actually because there is a, an imposition of modern ideas that things have to be categorized, they're either A or B. Everything is like um, um, polarized and, and made into these kind of um, mutually exclusive binaries. But actually there is, I argue, this tremendous fluidity between religious and secular ideas. And many people have argued that in the modern state, there, is, there are the echoes of a kind of religious past. And that the state stands in for God in some kind of way and so on. And, and I think that that's true, but I also think it's equally true that modern religious communities, even the, those that appear to be extremely insular and cut off and conservative and whatever else, are also imbibing in their own ways, even if it's not in their ideas, but in the structures of their thinking, these modern ideas. Um, so an awareness of that, I think, is really important to, to recognize that sometimes a um, the, 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 the very fact that something appears to be a zero sum game is itself something that can, that can be questioned. Um, and Israel is a case study in, in, in that, but I think that that principle applies across the board. Um, yeah, so I see, oh, um, I see Carrie has her hand raised, but I wanna just ask one little teeny tiny quick follow-up question here, right? Which is um, that, you know, it, just for the way that you're talking about all of these issues, um, it's almost like, like, you know, um, like you're talking about um, not just about the past, but also about various possibilities. Um, and I mean this in the sense that, like, I think that if you look at a lot of scholarship on the history of Zionism, for instance, uh, you know, over the past 10 or 15 years, there's an entire genre of, of the, you know, the, the roads not taken school, right? You know, sort of people looking, you know, especially at Zionism, you know, before, uh, you know, before the Holocaust. Uh, you know, various formulations of Jewish nationalism uh, you know, that didn't win out. Uh, and the, the, the underlying kind of idea is like maybe history could have gone another way, right? Yeah. You know, maybe some yeah. of the bad things that have happened over the past 50, 60 years didn't mm -hmm. necessarily have. Anyway, like this is the, like the rose not taken approach. So do mm -hmm. you see yourself, like you were just talking before about how like there's this rhetoric of this division between, you know, re religious and secular that, that we have to break, you know, break down on an intellectual and scholarly level, you know, and, and you're also talking about religious pluralism, you know, in a really positive way. So do you see this as also like a road not taken in a way that has a potential to contribute to the development of, of Israel in particular, but also the legal, um, legal frameworks in general? Yeah, so the roads not taken literature, I, I, I love and um, I think, uh, and, and I, I certainly wouldn't um, criticize it in, in any foundational way, but I do think that there's sometimes a, a danger in the way that the literature is taken, which is that, you know, it's often written by people who are saying like, you know, we don't have to be fighting because look at this guy in 1920 who said that like Palestinians and Jews are really like all should get along. And there was this moment where they signed an agreement and if only that had held, then things would be different. And it's a kind of way, it's often a way of sort of, um, of, of holding out some kind of hope um, and whatever else, which there's nothing wrong with holding out hope, um, obviously. But there is, um, there is a danger sometimes in, in saying that just because something could have been at one period of time, therefore maybe that's a model for how things can be now. Um, of course, historical context has changed. Things have happened since that time um, and, um, and, and, and circumstances are different. And I would, I would also add, if it's a road not taken, sometimes roads not taken were not taken for reasons, um, not necessarily thought through reasons, but reasons of um, um, sort of historical causality rather than pure contingency. So I'm a little wary of, the, of, of using roads not taken as a practical plan. Um, the re my reasons for, for showing like this could have been different and it isn't now is more as a, as a kind of 
um, as a heuristic device because the idea of, of a state hegemony is so prevalent nowadays that it's difficult to ask the question, why did it end up that way? Because the prevalence makes, us, makes it hard to recognize that another possibility was even there in the first place. So by showing that no people were seriously entertaining an alternative, it allows us to, answer, to ask primarily and then answer the question of why did things turn out like they are. Having said all that, I do think there is some practical effect here which is that a historical sensibility can kind of break the, the, um, the illusion that the ideology that you're in now is the only possible ideology. And I do think that that creates a bit of wiggle room for people to just look around a little bit more and be perhaps slightly less inflexible in their perspectives if things work as well as they, as well as they might. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, now, I know, Carrie, you had your hand raised. So I think that this is like probably the last question that we have time for. Um, so thanks. Okay, well, um, I just wanted to say that I find a lot of what you said very interesting because I've been trying to educate myself about Israeli politics. And from what I understand, it's all about the Benjamins right now. And we're seeing this left and right and they're just clashing with each other and they're in this tug of war over power. And I found it so interesting because I've heard Netanyahu say uh, kind of, I, I guess a little bit of contradicting rhetoric I've heard him say that Israel was meant to be a Jewish state. And then I've heard him say that Israel is the only democracy in the region. And so it's kind of strange that he's um, saying these different ideologies and he's getting so much support from what I understand from a lot of these Orthodox uh, rabbis and Orthodox leaders. And what I wanted to ask you is about their, um, I guess their attitude, attitude toward Benjamin Netanyahu uh, do they see him as like he's the, the chosen person who's here for Israel or do they see him that this is a business arrangement, we're going to help him politically and he's going to get things done for us? I mean, how do they view him? And especially now, since he's in a whole bunch of legal trouble, which one could argue is against both state and religious law um, or just state law. I mean, I don't know how they would argue that as far as that goes. That's a whole other uh, can of worms, but I, I just wanted to ask like what your thoughts are on this and how you think this whole conflict will play out. Um, sure. Uh, um, the, the, so I, I know that we're very short on time, so um, I'll, I'll answer as briefly as I can and then I'd be happy to follow up with you afterwards if that's something that you'd like. Um, so a, a few brief points. First of all, um, I've been talking about religious Zionism in a kind of monolithic way. And of course, there are many, many different schools of Orthodox um, Jews who are Israeli citizens or who are not Israeli citizens, who have different opinions and approaches to these, to these kinds of things. And many of the, not all, but many of the big players in Orthodox Judaism in Israel at the moment are actually um, part of an ultra-Orthodox schools that don't quite share the ideology of the people that I've been talking about. And it would take a bit long to kind of parse out exactly the differences, but I just wanted to state that there, there is this diversity. Um, in terms of um, Netanyahu um, appearing to say things which seem to contradict each other, um, I, you know, Netanyahu is a is a um, is a politician. He's a um, to, and uh, he's fighting for his political survival, but also for his legal, you know, survival as well. And um, he, I think, is willing to make whatever coalitions need to be made for for that to happen, as well as for what he sees to be the good of the state. Um, I will say just finally that. Um, there's a, a tremendous discussion, and I, this is something I'm also happy to recommend literature on, on the relationship between Israel as a Jewish state and Israel as a democratic state. And the, the laws of the state of Israel explicitly define the state both as Jewish and as democratic. Um, and I do think it's important to, to acknowledge that um, um, both the term Jewish and democratic have all kinds of different possible meanings. And there are um, meanings that we could attribute to each of those terms that are not contradictory in any way. I mean, you know, states have national cultures which are not necessarily um, um, in tension with democratic values, democratic principles. Um, but of course, there are ways of, so for example, if um, like the state I grew up in, um, I don't know, has like a, the, the St. George's Cross, a Christian cross is the flag of the state. As a Jew growing up in England, I didn't feel um, um, oppressed 
per se because of that because of that symbolic nature of, of the flag. Um, but having said that, of course, there are ways of deter defining these terms Jewish and democratic, in which they are very, they could be very much in tension, um, which would go for if the state um, ex explicitly or even implicitly privileged Jews over other people or distributed resources on, in, in, inequitably um, or, or confounded the political aspirations um, of, of people that um, simply by virtue of the fact that they were not Jewish. And these are the, these are the major battles that are taking place in Israel right now. I think among many, many Jews in Israel, um, the idea of Israel being a Jewish state in terms of terminology is not necessarily as contentious as the question of what that means. And is that is that something is is there a way of defining that that isn't necessarily in tension with democracy? And that's I think one of the the main questions facing the state today. Okay. There's a lot more to cut on that. Obviously, um, I'm happy to, to to follow up if you'd like. So, how do you think it will play out? Oh. I, 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 um, I learned a long time ago that predicting anything about, well, anything, but especially about Israeli politics is a very bad idea. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I'm reading the newspapers just like you. Um, I just hope that however it plays out is, 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 um, is an outcome that um, increases justice and reduces suffering for, for all the people involved. Yeah, I'm sorry that I I, I think I, I got kicked off. It happens to everybody, right? Um, so I was I wasn't able to hear that last bit, but I, I guess you guys all were able to. Jason, um, I just told you I just said exactly how the future of Israel would play out, and I guess you. Missed oh goodness! It. Well, now I now I I don't I, I don't know like I, I need to know that now. Um. Anyway, um. I just want to um to thank you again, Alex, for this really you know really interesting presentation. It's just fascinating. You know, and also for the conversation here. Um, you know, thank you so much for for joining us, um, and we're so glad to have you. And I'm just delighted. Thank you so much for the invitation, and especially thanks to all of you for for the generous conversation. And and I look forward to being in touch with you in the future. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Alex. It was great to meet you. You too. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Bye bye.